wanna talk? So let's talk. Welcome to Talk to Solomon. That's me, Stan Solomon, my co-host. Chief Steve. And former police chief, Steve Davis, and also Greg Howard, financial guru and uh, all-around smart guy. Hey, Greg. Hey there. Uh, I want to talk about money. The United States is in debt, on the books $16 trillion, off the books included probably $140 trillion, money that is unimaginable. Now... The United States is a big country with a big economy, whatever the economy is, $14, 15000000000000 trillion a year. In Davos, if I can say it right, Davos, D-A-V-O-S, the uh, environmental group over there, headed by former Mexican President Calderon, has said that they need, we need to spend $14 trillion to, quote-unquote, green the global economy. Now, $14 trillion, we know that of that amount of money, 80% of it would be consumed in the process, 20% or less would actually result in something, but after the uh, thievery and the, the whatever, the, the rightfully do whoever is uh, of the political elite, we probably wouldn't have but seven elephants who stopped farting because they shot him. Um, now, you think I'm close? Yeah, I think seven's too high. Oh, okay. Six, six. Uh, but I, I bring the story up because think of the, this is a Jewish word for those of you who don't know, the chutzpah, the, the, the gall, the, the, the thought process that says in a world that is hurting, hurting. We need to take six or $14 trillion from where? From whom? To green up the earth to solve a problem that doesn't exist and everyone already knows it. Yet our president, in his latest inaugural address, said why we have to address global warming. Yeah, we'll give it the address of the latest, greatest incinerator, where they can burn up that stupid idea. Anyway, Greg? Well, uh, where do I begin? First of all, uh, the, coming up with $16 trillion, uh, whatever it may be, for a nation that's already $16 trillion in debt with over $100,000 in unfunded liabilities from the Great Society and the New Deal that is still hanging over our heads, um, unless they figure out how to turn unicorn flatulence into currency, is not simply going. It's simply not going to happen. So, the other problem is, is as you exactly alluded to, uh, there it's not going to happen because everything that is turned over to such an agency will be siphoned off into fraud. And uh, we've already seen with Solyndra and other companies what happens when we invest in green energy. Third of all, this announcement could not come at a worse time when we just find out that uh, global unemployment has hit record levels, according to another article I read today on Business Insider. Well over 200 million people in developed nations are out of work right now. So what are we going to do with all this money? Where is it going to come from? Is absolutely a non-starter. You could not confiscate this much money from all the billionaires on the planet and come up with this much money. And where are we going to borrow it from? And what are they going to do? Print 16 $1 trillion coins like the crazy idea they floated a while back to, to uh, deal with our budget deficit? They're absolutely insane. First of all, green technologies, if they existed and were economical, the private market would have already pushed them to the front and we'd be buying them. One problem with these green solar and wind energy problems 
is we don't have the battery technology in order to make them work. You cannot store enough electricity overnight for a city with current battery technology. So, therefore, all your solar projects on the planet are not going to make this happen. So, so, and wind farms, all they're doing is killing birds, and at best you get 20 to 25% efficiency out of the best wind farm out there. They're just dreaming, and it's all just a matter of impoverishing the wealthy nations and putting it over to the developing nations. Let me tell you what global warming is and this whole cap-and-trade idea is. You take the rich nations who need energy credits and carbon credits, and you make them buy from economies that have nothing but grass huts. The grass hut economies are going to sell these credits to the nations who need them in order to continue running their factories. The people with the grass hut economies, their warlords will get all this money to continue killing their own people while we buy credits that mean nothing other than the ability to stay in business. It will be a giant global mafia. Well, it's well said, of course, Al Gore was right the center of this whole thing. Uh, he's now become, you know, richer than Romney, so to speak. But He is, but, in fact, richer than Romney now. That it's in, in money, but in no other way. But the, yeah, the, exactly. The fact is that the, the grass hut economies then guarantee that there will always be grass hut economies. They're giving up their upside, their future, to get money that they won't see any benefit from. Chief? Exactly. It's the same thing as the people who sit on their butts in return for a check, and all they have to do is go vote, vote for it every two years. Chief? Yeah, so uh, it, you mentioned Al Gore. Al Gore is our poster boy, and I'm sure they're saying, look what he did. We can do the same thing. We can fool everybody and lie to everybody and make a lot of money. So the, the thing that I always think about that doesn't come out very often is Barack Obama said he wants to do something about global warming. Well, if there is or if there is not global warming, human beings had nothing to do with it. And human beings can do nothing to stop it or improve it or change it. So all of this green technology, all of this uh, cap and trade talk is only about taking money and making people rich but nothing that will happen in any of this will do anything to make our environment any better. Nothing. So it's just a big scam. It's a way to take money. Uh, and eventually they'll say, well, the sky wasn't blue enough, so we're going to tax you more, or whatever the case may be. But it's got, no, human beings cannot in any way improve the environment. Other than, you know, we, we, we can, uh, we have water treatment plants and those types of things. There's common things we can do that we can improve some of our, uh, and we don't want to litter the landscape too much. Those things we can do. But as far as actually changing the climate, is, we can't do it. It's so interesting. We can't yeah. do it. Here's a factoid, and, and then I'll get back to Greg. Do you know that one volcanic eruption, substantial volcanic eruption, like Mount St. Helens or one of those, Pinatubo, uh, or Pinatubo, I don't care, Pinatubo, but anyway. Pinatubo. Yeah, but I'm talking about Tebow. But anyway, my point, <laughs> is, my point is one substantial volcanic eruption puts out more pollutants than all of humanity since God put us here. Does anybody know that? There, there, you can have as many cows passing gas. You can have as many women spraying their hair. You can have as many people uh, using incandescent light bulbs or driving SUVs. It makes no difference. One volcanic eruption like Pinatubo or like Mount St. Helens, puts more pollutants in the air than all of humanity for all of our history. And nature cleans it up itself. Exactly. It knows how to do it, just like the oil spills. Oil comes out of the ground. It came out of nature. Nature can clean it up. What's but also, I'm going to tell you this. You mentioned Mount St. Helens. When that, when that happened, uh, some loggers went in, and they replanted some of the trees, and they left part of it un unattended to see would nature or man replace those trees faster. Nature had no comparison. Man replaced those trees quicker than you know what. Of course. And, and by the way, when Saddam Hussein set all the oil wells in, all the oil wells in Kuwait uh, on fire in 91 or whatever that was, uh, th that put out more pollution than anyone could even calculate. And two, three years later, you can't tell anything ever happened. Mm -hmm. It's just unbelievable. 
I saw that firsthand, by the way. I was over there as a consultant immediately after the war, and uh, you could not see the sun. Uh, the temperature was incredibly cold. Uh, what little bit of the sun you could see was an eerie blood red, and you could see a black sky and oil fires in every direction. It really reminded me of a scene, uh, you know, that I had come up in one, in my mind the first time I read Dante's Inferno. I was just going to say that. Yeah, but, but, uh, listen. but let's let's talk just a little bit about the evil of human beings. First of all, if you're a creationist, we're supposed to be here. Second of all, if you're an evolutionist, we're supposed to be here. So. This idea that human beings don't belong on the planet is a non-starter, so let's scratch that. Second of all, I'm a conservationist, not an environmentalist. I was raised a Boy Scout. I was in Boy Scouts all my life up until I got my Eagle, and then I moved on quickly because I had done what I needed to do get, to get my driver's license. Um, but I also became a Scoutmaster and uh, put my boy through Boy Scouts. And uh, we teach conservation, which is the wise use as you alluded to earlier, Stan, the stewardship of Earth's resources. There is no reason for us not to use the resources of the planet for our own good, but we need to do so in a wise manner. Now, a wise manner does not mean acting like uh, idiots and uh, you know just uh, throwing things away uh, unnecessarily, but that also does not mean that we go without simply because some nutcase wants to save a fish in California that shouldn't even be there in that ecosystem like they're doing right now, starving out the farmers of the Central Valley. So this is why we have to deal with these environmental nutcases. Most of the time they're arguing things that they don't even understand. Well, I think that the best thing you do for an environmentalist is feed him to a wild animal so he can really uh, be a part of the ecosystem and feel complete. Yeah, the, the, let them be part of the circle of life and come out as a giant poop somewhere. Speaking of the circle of life in New Zealand, an environmentalist is saying you have to eliminate cats as pets because they kill birds. Chief. Well, um, if you're a bird lover, you, there may be some validity there in your own household, but if you go back, the Egyptians had cats. And the, the cats and the Egyptians made a team together. And actually today, house cats are the only animal that maintain all of their wild abilities and domesticated abilities. But without the cats, the Egyptians would have had a very tough time keeping their grains from, from being eaten by the mice. No, by the Democrats. Yes, uh, same, com same, confused. same thing. Okay. Uh, I thought the, the cobras were the Democrats, but okay. That's okay. all right. No, but it, but, but, but ca cats are a very important uh, animal. They're a very important pet. Happen to be, I have two cats of my own and five dogs. I love cats, and they are a great, great asset to a home. I don't have any mice, by the way, in my home. Uh, I yeah, guess. I live out in the country, and without the two cats we have, we'd be overrun with mice. Every, every couple of days, they bring us a present, and we're grateful for our cats. Right, there you go. Well, I, I'm just trying to point out that the term environmentalist and, and the term lobotomized, uh, I think, come from the same root word. Uh, Optimism. Optimism is an incredibly important part of life. Optimistic people tend to be happier. They look forward. Uh, they feel better. Uh, pessimistic people are more dour. Uh, they're, they're, by the very term pessimist, it means that they don't expect things to work out. They're less likely to try. They're less likely to stay with something. Uh, according to this headline, and the story didn't print, American optimism hits lowest point since Jimmy Carter. Hello. Is that telling you something about who's happy about Obama? And the answer is idiots. Idiots. Mostly minority idiots, but idiots. Homosexual idiots, but idiots. Disingenuous, uh, dishonest people, but idiots. Gee. This is an important topic to me in all aspects of life because... All human beings, we, we learn to be uh, negatively programmed. When we were children, our parents told us the word no compared to the word yes about 10,000 to 1. Don't, don't run. Don't put that in the electrical socket. Don't touch the stove, blah, blah, blah. So our brains think we want to be negatively programmed. We need positive reinforcement from time to time until you're self-trained like me to be able to be optimistic all the time. But when we're surrounded by all the pessimistic things in America today that comes from the White House and on down, it's hard for people to not really get out of that mode. So I understand this totally, and we need a, when Ronald Reagan was president, he was an optimistic president, and the, the attitudes are contagious. 
you know, and we can catch other people's attitudes. So the attitude of Barack Obama is very pessimistic, very, very degrading, and very demeaning. And so people that are not ready for that, Americans that are not ready for that, are going to have a pessimistic outlook. Greg? Extremely well said, Steve. Um, you know, the, the Reagan campaign was so positive. I remember this. I was a young man of 20, and uh, we had just been beaten up for a long time with the hostage crisis and uh, bad economy under Jimmy Carter. And the day after Ronald Reagan was elected, you could feel the mood lift in the formation of Marines that I was standing in that morning. We just knew things were going to get better. Now, it took a couple of years before the economy started to pick up. I mean, it wasn't an overnight Ronald Reagan came into office in January and boom, the economy took off. It took a lot before the economy. But... The mood was better. He came on TV. He was America's grandfather or elderly father, and he kept telling everyone it was going to get better. He had a twinkle in his eye, and even when he jabbed at the left viciously, he did it with a twinkle, and he said it in a way that made you laugh. Obama has no Reagan-esque characteristics. He comes across as mean. He comes across as a bully. There's nothing funny about Barack Obama unless you enjoy watching someone else getting beaten up verbally. That is the only thing fun about Barack Obama, and you're a very sick and twisted person if you watch that and enjoy it. Obama does not have the ability to inspire. He only has the ability to destroy and divide. But also just to, to uh, add on to what Greg just said, which was great, is that he just pointed out that under Reagan, things got better. It's much more easy to be optimistic if, you're, if your life is getting better. Under Obama, our lives are getting worse. No ifs, ands, or buts. Right. Speaking of worse, Phil Mickelson. I'm not a big golf fan. I'm a Tiger Woods fan, but I'm not a big golf fan. But he's a major, major player, a big money winner. Uh, and, of course, he's backtracked because all the politically correct folks jumped on him uh, and threatened his endorsements. But he basically said, look, it doesn't make sense to go out and work hard and, and, and be disciplined if they're going to take away 75% of what you make. And in California, that is what they take away. Most people don't understand how high the taxes are in California. They take like 10 11% or more. Now you've got the government taking 40% or more. You've got the state. You've got all the other layers of taxation. You know, the, the idea of the fair tax, which has kind of died down, unfortunately, is that everything that you buy has a built-in uh, tax cost. For instance, farmers who grow grain pay taxes on the profit from selling their grain. The, the grain is priced so they can pay their taxes. The millers that buy the grain so they can grind it into, uh, you know, processable uh, product, uh, they pay taxes on what they earn. They've already bought a product that has a tax cost in it. So now when they sell it to the bakeries, there's another piece of that price that has to do with taxes. The bakers, when they bake the bread and they sell it, they have to pay taxes on their profit, so their price has to include that piece so that when the, the uh, stores that buy the bread from the bakers, like the Kroger's or whoever they might be, they have to pay a price of the bread that includes three layers of taxation. When they sell the bread, they have to pay taxes on what they make so their price has to include that factor. So when you buy the bread, you're paying, in that simple explanation, four layers of taxation so that in round numbers, about a quarter of the price that you pay for bread, let's assume for the sake of discussion, you're paying $2, 50 cents of it is not paying for anything to do with the bread, it's having to pay for the taxes at each layer. The fair tax said no taxes 
on any layer but a consumption tax. And that consumption tax was suggested to be 23%. I'm going to make it 25. So if you were to take $1.50, which is the cost of the bread without any of those taxes, add 25% to $1.50, you have 22 and a half cents. That's a dollar seventy-seven. Now, I didn't go to a, 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 a you know an upper crust school. I went to a public school, but when I back, went back there, the teachers were heterosexual and they taught reading, writing, and arithmetic. So, where I come from, a dollar seventy-seven is less than two dollars. So, if you would eliminate all these taxes and add this twenty-three percent tax, which would give government the same funding at the same level. Everybody, and by the way, no one would pay taxes. No one would pay taxes on their salary. So instead of getting 400, you would get 525 or whatever your salary happens to be because no taxes, no Social Security, no unemployment, no nothing. You just get the money. So if everyone was paid the same amount, the price of everything would actually go down. At the very most, it would stay the same, but you have 25% more money on average to spend. Would someone tell me why in the hell we're not doing that? Because we're not punishing the rich that way. And that's the goal of the story is that the, the left wants to punish people like Phil Mickelson who work and make a lot of money. And in this story, Phil Mickelson complained about the fact that he was getting 63% uh, of his salary taken away in taxes. And, and he talked about moving from California to a state with no state income taxes like Texas or Florida and was beaten up by the left so bad he's apologized for saying that and said, I won't talk about it anymore. I'm going to do it in private. But he's still going to move. Greg, well, if he's smart, your he will. Example, uh, there were a couple of uh, misconceptions about taxes that were missed. First of all, uh, people think, oh, we're going to tax the corporations. First of all, corporations never pay a dime of taxes. It's always the end user. You did point that out in your example that it does fall on the consumer. But you did miss two levels of taxation. That would be the sales tax at the end, as well as the hidden tax of inflation that comes from the government printing money. You're absolutely right that the fair tax would make more sense. It would actually reduce the end cost to consumers. Unfortunately, that does not give the government control through the tax code. Those 60,000, 70,000 pages of codes and regulations exist for one reason and one reason only to give favors to some businesses and to punish others, to, give, uh, to curry votes with one group and to discourage the success of other groups. The tax code is all about control, not about bringing in revenue to the government. And that is the one thing people have got to learn and understand about our current taxation situation. It is not about bringing revenue into the government. It is about giving favors and dispensations to some, controlling others, and discouraging competition for the chosen few. Well said, and on that note, we're going to call it a night. Uh, final thought, Greg. I would wish everybody would uh, educate themselves, first of all, about the Bill of Rights, because that is where the attack is going right now. If you do not understand the Constitution and the importance of the Second Amendment, please go to gregwhoward.com. We have Dr. Key's epic rant from the last time he was on the show. You can listen to it in its entirety and listen to every word he said. No one explains the Second Amendment better than he does. Again, that is gregwhoward.com. It is the headline article this week. Chief. I am a big golf fan, and I never was a fan of Tiger Woods. I always thought he was too self-centered and pompous. But uh, most people know that his marriage went down in a disastrous end, uh, a very public end. But he has recently asked his wife to get back together and is willing to, has offered to sign a, a no-cheating clause. And I just, if he does that, if that happens, I'm a big Tiger Woods fan. I think any man that can say, I made a mistake, I want to make it better, I'm your fan. Uh, you once said, it takes a big man to admit he was wrong, and I'm that big man. All right. I am still a Tiger Woods fan. I like the guy. I don't like what he does. Uh, but having been less than perfect my entire life, uh, I, I do forgive. Thank you, America. Frankly, we're depending on you because if you don't step up, if you don't stand up, if you don't load up, we're done. Good night, America.
Oh, my God.